Okay, so why did we deal with aviation um, in the EU ETS? And I think that it is good to, to remind ourselves that the EU has a fairly well-established uh, climate change policy. And uh, the well-established climate change policy is having a target. In fact, we already agree to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, with, on average, 20% uh, by 2020 measured on 1990 levels. And we would go deeper down to minus 85% by 2050. So that's clearly a downward trend. And uh, we have, uh, as tools already in place, the European Emissions Trading Scheme. You know, that is a, a kind of system where allowances are given or bought by companies to cope or to offset their emissions. And uh, if they have a surplus of these allowances, they can sell them to someone else. So there is a market of these allowances. And uh, we have, of course, also targets for all installations falling out of the European Emissions Trading Scheme. The Emissions Trading Scheme covers roughly half of the emissions of Europe. Let's say all power stations and all industrial facilities. What falls out are households, transport, etc., for which we have specific legislation. And so we come to aviation because we are regulating our cars, for example. Uh, we have very uh, demanding legislation that has been picked up very well by the car manufacturers. And so on transport, we see all the time growing trends. And so um, the question was, um, what is going to happen in aviation? And when we take uh, the analysis that was done by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, they expect by 2050 a growth in aviation emissions from on average between 300 and 700 percent. So instead of going down with 85 percent, we just go up with 500 to uh, 300 to 700 percent, which is quite an important phenomenon. And so the question that is uh, put to the legislator is how can we have good air traffic activity without having the disadvantage of this uh, growing emissions. And so um, we were in the EU uh, looking at a series of measures. We can have uh, uh, modernization, ATM modernization, as it is called, the single European sky. We can have all kinds of, of initiatives as, as, as uh, CESAR, uh, which are technical measures we want to put in place, research and development. We can have new standards for uh, aircraft and CO2 standards per aircraft. And uh, we apply all these measures. And on top of that, we have market-based measures because we are fully convinced, and that was shown by our analysis, if we only are going to go for technical measures, we are not going to get there. On top of that, we have to incentivize businesses. And on the market-based measures, that is inclusion into the European emissions trading system, we were going around and we asked to manufacturers of uh, engines and of aircraft what they would do. And to our surprise, they said they had lots of technological devices already on the table, but there was no incentive to, to buy them. And so market-based measures could create that incentive, and so uh, that was what we were doing. But of course, we have in Europe a very strong uh, tradition of multilateralism. And we would not go out without having thought and talked through the international implications. And so we had a full debate in the International Civil Aviation Organization that supported an instrument like emissions trading, but said in 2004 that such an instrument like emissions trading would not be developed by the ICAO itself, but would have to be incorporated into the emission trading scheme that different parties may have. So that was a little bit our surprise, I have to say, in 2004. But we got that out of the assembly. And so we were developing our uh, legislation while strongly communicating to the rest of the world and to ICAO that we were in favor of a global uh, solution. Uh, we took note of the fact that the assembly said emissions trading can be done provided you are incorporating that into national or regional schemes. And that is exactly uh, what we did. So uh, other reasons why uh, we went to emissions trading 
is that, of course, it, it has to be very much in line with our international commitments, but we have very well-known economic benefits coming from emissions trading. Uh, least cost solutions is not the most, uh, it's, it's not the least attractive one of these. So you can easily reach a given objective at the least cost. You leave it to the economic operator to sort out how the emission reductions is going to be sorted out. Some uh, air companies are going to rely on biofuels or others may buy uh, modern aircraft or some others may want to renovate their aircraft or may discourage their passengers to take a lot of weighty and bulky stuff with them. So we leave that to the uh, airline operators themselves, as we do for ETS-covered installations in general. Um, uh, remarkably was that we went through a quite comprehensive debate with the industry and in uh, 2006 IATA, uh, the International uh, uh, Association of Airlines, said that uh, uh, ETS is probably the least cost and most effective way to reduce uh, aviation's climate impacts in, in Europe. So we were preparing that legislation quite, uh, quite uh, extensively. And so let's look, so we did, we included uh, the aviation into the EU ETS. And so um, we have that uh, legislation now in place. Uh, it was proposed in 2006 and it is in force since 2009. According to European procedures, we went through co-decision and the measure was adopted with unanimity in the Council and with an overwhelming majority in the European Parliament. So the EU member states have to uh, adopt implementing laws, and they all did. And the uh, emissions monitoring and the reporting started in 2010. And so uh, uh, all was uh, going smooth and well uh, until uh, end of last year, when the real deadline came uh, in sight, namely that as of 30th of April 2013, allowances must be surrendered as of the 1st of January 2012. And so we got a little bit of a uh, surprise reaction because that was uh, for ourselves, strictly speaking, legislation done years ago and really an implementing mood. So uh, we are, uh, as of today, a year before uh, April 2013 and uh, the question is uh, where we are uh, as of today. Um, what are the costs of the uh, travel uh, that... Um, that is caused through the inclusion in EU ETS. Well, you know that the prices on the carbon market are today relatively low. Um, some would like to have them higher, but that's now besides the point. Uh, we have relatively low prices, and uh, we made all kinds of uh, estimates about what the cost impact per ticket would be. And the cost impact is vari variable between 2 and 12 uh, euros per passenger for a, a transatlantic flight. So I think that's very moderate if you see uh, what a, a flight costs transatlantic. And so uh, this is a modest increase. And I think that everybody would agree that the inclusion into ETS is uh, quite cheap, quite cost effective. And it, it is, to remind you, putting a cap on the allowances. It is not putting directly a tax forward because that cost related to the allowances uh, could be covered by uh, airline operators uh, in the way they would like to have it. So uh, if we compare that to, for example, passenger fees that uh, a number of European and non-European states are currently implementing, uh, I think that the costs are way beyond what the EU ETS may imply. So um, I think we can agree that the impact, the economic impact, is uh, relatively um, uh, limited. And the impacts on airlines are equally uh, limited. Now, there has been a, uh, a number of uh, uh, questions even on whether we may not see for airlines exactly the same as we saw with power generators in the first phase of the EU ETS. That is that a considerable amount of allowances was given for free. And for the airline business, that's 85% of their average emissions. And so they have only to top up the last bit of their allowances to the extent they do not succeed in bringing down their emissions. Uh, but nevertheless, they can calculate through the value of the allowances 
into the market price. And so there has been, and there is still a debate about windfall profits. Even an American study done by MIT is saying that uh, perhaps this could even be a, a case where airlines uh, may make a net revenue. We refrained of going into that debate. I'm just uh, trying to highlight that uh, the impact, the economic impact on airlines is uh, modest uh, and is fully uh, recognized uh, um, throughout. What are the main benefits? Uh, well, we reckon that there will be uh, significant emission savings. We reckon that there will be an increased demand for biofuels uh, because the, the EU ETS is clearly going to act as an incentive. And uh, we uh, re uh, reckon that uh, we are also going to see an increase in the demand for credits on the carbon market created through the UN system, and that are the credits from clean tech uh, projects that are done through the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can easily assume that quite a considerable amount of the expenses made by airline companies is going uh, to flow back through uh, companies. So where is then the real problem? And um, uh, you wonder what the real problem is. And one of the problems that I think also the chair was mentioning uh, is the uh, problem of extraterritoriality. Is the measure extraterritorial in that sense that it, it, it covers uh, things that Europe should not cover? Um, extraterritoriality comes from the fact that all aircraft in Europe, landing and departing, have to pay for their allowances over the whole stretch from the last port they were departing from and the next port they are flying to. So that is clearly also outside Europe. And, um, and hence the extraterritoriality that was uh, uh, taken as a, as a kind of criticism. Now, um, US airlines went to the court, to a London court, uh, that um, transferred the case to the European Court, court of Justice, which is the highest court in Europe. And uh, the European Court of Justice ruled that the measure is not extraterritorial because legally speaking, it is only the landing and the departing act that triggers the obligation to cover for the, uh, for the emissions cost. And so um, uh, th that question of extraterritoriality according to our highest court should be out of the question and should, should be done with. Uh, however, uh, we hear that, for example, the United States or, for example, China and India say, we do not believe your court. And that is where we have a real problem. Uh, we tell them, you know, we have the rule of law. Uh, then then when, when you have a dispute, you go to court, as the American Airlines did, and the court rules, and then you have to, to implement what the court is saying. So the court was quite clear that extraterritorial, uh, extraterritoriality is not happening. And so um, we are proceeding with the, uh, uh, with the uh, implementation of the system. So um, uh, apart from that, uh, we have seen quite a number of activities. Uh, most important to mention are the meetings in Delhi and Moscow that took place uh, end of last year and beginning of this year. Uh, that are easily dubbed uh, in the international press the coalition of the unwilling because they were not willing to consider inclusion into the um, ETS scheme. And they were uh, making noises about retaliation uh, because they disliked the measure. And uh, the, that was the negative part of the story. The positive part of the story was that they were all speaking in favor of renewing the debate in the ICAO context, the International Civil Aviation Organization. So, uh, and we are, have always been in favor of such a debate. So uh, I think that these meetings were partly bad news and partly good news. Uh, and the bad news, I think that the retaliation measures were listed up with a lot of mays and mites. Um, so far, no country, and I underline no country, has gone for re retaliation measures. But there is a lot of talk about that in the international press. 
we in the European Commission are following in that uh, very, um, uh, very keenly up. Uh, we talk to all parties in the world and uh, all relevant countries. And, um, and, and so far, retaliation confirmed by the Chinese uh, uh, not later than last week, uh, where the Chinese have been saying, we are not interfering with the commercial decisions that our companies are making. And that was referring to the so-called uh, retaliation that could take place uh, for aircraft that was bought uh, uh, with uh, Airbus. Um, now, um, we have no other choice. I think that uh, we have to make sure that uh, the, the, the law is being respected uh, because that's the duty, at least, that the Commission has on its shoulders. Once the legislation has been adopted, the uh, legislation must be uh, uh, implemented. But uh, you, remind, uh, you remember yourself that I was indicating that April 2013 is the first date of surrendering of allowances. And so we are supporting very much a continued discussion in the context of ICAO. And we have a strong belief that between now and April 2013, we have a full year to hammer out the questions that need to be hammered out. Um, so we have an open agenda if it is the issue extraterritoriality, is the issue related to the revenues raised, whatever the issue is, we are open for a discussion in ICAO, but we make clear to our, our, all our international partners that we have legislation and that we just cannot put our legislation on hold. Uh, legislation has gone through the normal policy cycle and, uh, and uh, has been brought up to the highest court and the court has said there is no problem. So unless there is a new fact, either a legal fact or a political fact, we have no argument in our hands uh, not to implement uh, the legislation. But our legislation has two pieces of flexibility uh, given for the Commission to operate. And the first is that in the event of an international agreement, uh, the directive states that we are open to amend the scheme. So if we would hope for a moment that we have a window of opportunity of one year for having uh, accelerated discussions in the ICAO, we are prepared, given the outcome of that discussion, to amend our legislation in the light of an international agreement. And the other element that is foreseen in the legislation, through comitology, for those who are familiar <laughs> with our uh, uh, Euro jargon, uh, that is that we are covering incoming flights and departing flights. And of course, if we have an international agreement where everybody takes care of the departing flights, there is no longer a need also to cover incoming flights because every departing flight is somewhere, somehow, an incoming flight. So um, our legislation foresees that through a relatively simple procedure, we can drop incoming flights in case we would have an international agreement where all um, departing flights are taken uh, care of. So where are we now as of today, as we speak? Uh, the ICAO's president has announced that uh, he is accelerating the activities in the context of ICAO. And there was an ICAO council not more than uh, 10 days ago that adopted a work program on market-based measure measures in fact, on four uh, different options for a market-based measure to be developed ultimately, and also the development of a framework within which um, uh, market-based measures could be uh, developed. So what is good to see is that the uh, message has been taken up through uh, multiple pressure, our pressure, pressure by the Chinese, the Indians, pressure by the United States, and that ICAO is now taking on the work and that work is uh, uh, going on at a much more accelerated speed, uh, speed compared to anything we have been seeing. So um, we hope that ICAO is going to deliver and that we will have a kind of global arrangement by, say, the end of the year, because we would need the beginning of next year to adapt our legislation. And um, we are uh, fully supportive of that, uh, of that um, uh, meeting of that process. We will see a number of meetings um, because this uh, meeting series that started in Delhi and then took place in Moscow uh, is going to be continued. Next meeting 
is going to take place uh, as it seems in Saudi Arabia. But uh, we hope that these meetings are going to bring us forward in terms of a constructive, a positive agenda. Because uh, if the process is only about the merits and the demerits of ETS, we are not going to advance very much. We need a kind of multilateral measure that is going to uh, address the issue. So that would be my introduction, and I'm uh, open for all possible questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much.